Okay, um, on my first day back, I'm delivering Jared Bernstein to all of you, uh, who we're thrilled to have to give some brief remarks on the economic news today uh, and answer some questions, and then we will do a briefing as long as we can uh, before the president departs. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Jared. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, today's jobs report provides yet another indicator that, as the president said this morning, quote, our economy has gone from being on the mend to being on the move. In the first conversation I had with the president when he was a candidate, he explained his view that we faced a dual health and economic crisis, and that we could not attack one without attacking both. That intervention became the American Rescue Plan, and the historically strong labor market we see in today's jobs report is a testament to not just the president's correct diagnosis and prescription, but his insistence that the plan be quickly and efficiently implemented to get COVID and economic relief, shots and arms and checks and pockets into the system. Today we learn that we've got an unemployment rate of 3.6%, a tick above its pre-pandemic rate of 3.5. We've got an historically unpre unprecedented run with data back to 1939 of 11 months in a row with job gains north of 400,000, yielding an also unprecedented 7.9 million jobs since President Biden took office. We have, in one of the most welcome trends we at CEA are seeing in the job market, increased labor force participation. And we have strong wage growth, particularly for middle and lower page workers. Getting under the hood of the report a bit. As you know, the Council of Economic Advisors were careful to not overinterpret one month of data, and therefore we always cite the three month average, which in this case is the first quarter of the year. With the upward revisions in today's report, the average monthly gain over the quarter is 562,000 jobs per month. Now, pro to provide some context for that growth pace, last month marked 23 months since employment hit its pandemic low. At a comparable point in the last expansion, the three-month av three average of job growth was 229,000, making the current jobs recovery more than twice as fast. The black unemployment rate ticked down by four tenths to 6.2%, just two tenths above its pre-pandemic rate. As noted, one of the most important indicators in the current job market is labor force participation. 
rising participation rates will facilitate a closer alignment of strong labor demand with labor supply, helping to support working families and to boost our real economic output. Last month, labor force participation ticked up by a tenth overall and by a significant three tenths for the closely watched, quote, prime age workers category, which focuses on workers age 25 to 54. Doesn't mean that people who are over 54 are no longer prime, but that's a different discussion. The prime age participation rate in March was just a half a point below its pre-pandemic rate and it is up by an historically strong 1.4 percentage points since President Biden took office. In other words, last month's bump was not a monthly blip, but is part of an ongoing trend. It's a trend and also in a trend that's highly consistent with President Biden's Make It in America agenda. Factory employment was up 38,000 last month and 473,000 since the president took office. In other words, we are in the midst of, a, uh, uh, of the fastest business cycle recovery of manufacturing employment in more than 50 years. Now, as you know, we economists are always looking for policy lessons that we can apply to our work as we deal with a complex, ever-changing and ever-challenging global economy. In that regard, today's job, uh, jobs market uh, provides a clear lesson. American employers and workers have taken every headwind thrown at them and just kept humming along. As the president said today, quote, the headwinds of Delta, Omicron, and even the war in Europe have not been able to derail our, job, uh, our record jobs recovery, end quote. It is unequivocally clear that one of the most important policies behind that result is the uh, American Rescue Plan. Of course, our work is not done and we are actively addressing challenges faced by American households, especially uncomfortably high inflation. As you know, just yesterday, the President authorized the release of one million barrels per day for the next six months from our Strategic Petroleum Reserve the largest release from our national reserves in history. And this morning, countries across the world agreed to release tens of millions of additional barrels into the market. This work is, of course, highly complementary to our near-term work in speeding the pace at which goods move from ship to shelf and to our longer-term agenda, including the bipartisan infrastructure laws project, uh, projects to strengthen and increase the resiliency of our infrastructure and supply chains that, in turn, is complemented by the Bipartisan Innovation Act, which is geared towards making more in America, strengthening supply chains, and breaking up bottlenecks like semiconductor chips that are raising prices for consumers. Our legislative agenda is also focused on reducing some of the toughest strains on family budgets, including prescription drugs, the cost of child and elder care, health care premiums, the cost of housing and education. But the fact that all of this work is occurring against the backdrop of one of the tightest, most welcoming labor markets on record is both a testament to the president's policy agenda and to the unceasing energy and efforts of the American people. Thank you, and uh, we'll move to your questions. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks for doing this. Uh, the president said today that he thinks part of the mm -hmm. impact of this will be you know, uh, easing the supply chain, crunches more people in jobs, it'll smooth out that uh, I wondered your view on that, and in particular, we're seeing uh, new COVID lockdowns in China that has in the past sort of fueled supply chain crises down the line. What is your view on that right now? Let me, start with, let me start with the first part of your question, and I'm glad you asked it because it's one of the more important kind of under the hood indicators in today's jobs report that uh, should really uh, get uh, uh, the attention of anyone who's following, following the very issues you've raised. One of the things that uh, needs to happen in this labor market is to the very strong labor demand that in my comments, as you say, as you, as you heard, I associated uh, with uh, some of the very important benefits of the rescue plan, very strong labor demand needs to uh, better align with labor supply. The way that happens is through increased labor force participation rates. Now, as I mentioned uh, in March, that ticked up by a tenth of a percent. But I also cited what we call the prime age uh, rate, which is for workers 25 to 54. Labor economists like to look at that prime age rate because it takes out teenagers and retirees and looks at, at folks who are most connected typically to the job market. That ticked up uh, three tenths of a percent in March. But more importantly, and again, we have long stressed that, that, that especially when you're looking at these monthly numbers, you've got to look to the trend. 
That indicator is up by 1.4 points since this president took office. And if you look at the pace at which the labor force participation rate is increasing, it is faster in this recovery than any of the past four or five recoveries. So that kind of development better aligns the very strong labor demand with labor supply in ways that will ease some of the, uh, some of the price pressures as the president referenced today. Um, you asked about, uh, oh, uh, China. But, you know, what is the net effect of China locking down, but more Americans being in the workforce? Sure. The so these 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 are precisely the kinds of uh, 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 issues that we have been tracking ever since this pandemic uh, uh, came on the scene. Uh, we know that we uh, are still in a uh, an economy where the pandemic and a global economy where the pandemic is playing a role. But as I stressed in my comments today, and the president said the same thing, I guess I'm saying the same thing he said to be more accurate. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the headwinds of Delta, Omicron, and even war in Europe have not been able to re derail our record jobs recovery. Yes, there's uncertainty, there are headwinds, and some of those headwinds uh, are uh, amplified by uh, uh, Putin's unprovoked war uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and yet we see month after month uh, American employers and American workers shaking off those headwinds, uh, creating record number of jobs, and creating such an important economic backdrop for American households uh, to get by in this challenging period. Mike? Um, hey, Jared. So what um, – the, the chart that you showed that was up there before with the huge bar for Biden, at what point does it become <laughs> – more fair to stop measuring the growth in, in jobs and the growth in the economy against the recovery from the depths of the pandemic and begin to be more fair to measure President Biden's progress at increasing from the pre-pandemic levels? Well, I think that it's already uh, uh, fair to do that in the following sense. Um, if you look at some of the indicators, whether it's um, uh, jobs themselves, payroll employment, yeah, you're right, this is not showing the time series, it's just the bar. But if you look at the time series, uh, you will see a V uh, when things tanked and they came back pretty quickly. Um, same thing with labor uh, force participation. And I'm going to put this, I had a great slide, we weren't able to get it together here. I'm going to put it on my Twitter thread later, Econ Jared 46 um, uh, later today. Um, Give him a follow. <laughs> uh, 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 and, and it will show the same thing, I'm like, which is you see a V, and then you see uh, a, a period of an ongoing trend uh, start out and continue, and in the case of uh, labor force participation for prime age workers, even accelerate a bit. And I think that we're 23, in, 23 months into a recovery now. I think it is completely legitimate to cite these numbers in terms of an ongoing trend, very much fueled by a virtuous cycle of strong consumers uh, creating uh, demand for goods and services, uh, which in turn leads to strong labor demand month after month, driving the kind of numbers we saw today. One quick follow-up. I mean, we're still not back to pre-pandemic employment levels, correct? And yes. most of the indications, most of the measurements that Americans might want to want you to say to, to measure President Biden against is not like okay, well, we dug ourselves out of the hole, but how much further are we getting above where we would have been had the pandemic not started? Yeah. And, and when do you guys start having to to measure against that? A measure against like okay, we're now five hundred thousand, a million jobs above where you know where we were before the terrible pandemic. So there are a variety of ways to, to look at that. Um, uh, I would commend you to some work recently by Moody's, which uh, uh, looks at uh, counterfactuals, the idea of what might have happened had we not had the rescue plan. And in every case, you're going to see job gains uh, and unemployment declines You know, well ahead. I, I remember the unemployment number, that the unemployment rate might be two percentage points higher than it is right now, uh, but for the uh, American rescue plan. You're right that jobs are not back to their pre-pandemic uh, peak yet. They're still 1.6 million or 1 percent below their pre-pandemic level. But they are climbing back at a rate. Look, I told you, 1.6 million from the peak and an average uh, monthly job growth rate of 562,000 per month. So do, do the math. That's, you know, that's three months out. Now, I'm not, predicting, I'm not predicting that's going to happen. I'm just saying if you extend the trend, that's what you'd see. But I think the most important point uh, that we're talking about here 
is that there is an ongoing labor market recovery with strong momentum that is delivering really solid job opportunities to American families. And that is such an important backdrop given the challenges that those families face in today's economy. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. Uh, quick question about the President's uh, comments this morning. He was talking about the SBR release as a wartime bridge. And if you could talk a little bit about what he uh, meant when he said that. Uh, is it a wartime bridge to uh, energy independence? Uh, maybe getting companies to ramp up production? Is it a wartime bridge to the Iran deal? Or a wartime bridge to perhaps both? And secondly, uh, conversations with a lot of um, oil and gas company CEOs have been ongoing. For, for several weeks now. Are, are, have there been sort of any specific commitments that the White House has been able to get from them when it comes to ramping up production? So on your first question, I think the way to think about this is kind of a walk and chew gum moment. Uh, I think of the bridge that the President was talking about as very much from the perspective of the American consumer who is facing real pressures at the pump. Uh, you know, the last time we did a, 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 a SPRO release, uh, an SPR release, um, we saw um, oil prices uh, fall quite quickly, and prices at the pump followed uh, were down at, at least 10 cents a gallon, as I remember, uh, pretty close out of the gate. Now, if you look just in the last uh, day or two, uh, I look at the, before I came up here, uh, I saw oil is down about $7 a barrel, uh, something around 7 or 8 uh, percent since the President made his call. And so when he's talking about a bridge, he's talking about helping American consumers with this aggressive, uh, historically large uh, 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 distribution of barrels uh, from the uh, strategic reserves. Um, the, uh, the idea of the, uh, of the President's uh, clean energy and sustainable economy and decarbonization agenda is very much alive, very much ongoing, and that's the chew gum part. You know, that we, we have to make sure we help consumers get through this difficult period and uh, help to bring down the impact as best we can of the Putin price hike. Uh, but at the same time, we simply cannot uh, uh, give any sort of short shrift to our clean energy agenda that is so essential for building not just a sustainable future, but a future of good jobs here in America. One final point. Uh, when the, the, while the, while the uh, strategic oil release uh, should have the impacts that I and the, or earlier the President said today, that doesn't mean that the impacts of the, uh, of the conflict in Ukraine are somehow uh, no longer in play. They, they are still in the picture, and of course we will, we will follow them, particularly from the impact of commodity prices, food and energy specifically, and, and but not exclusively. Any commitments from the company specifically? I don't have a readout on those conversations. Jared, a month from today, the student loan payment pause hmm. is due to expire. And a number of uh, congressional Democrats sent the President a letter yesterday saying it was their sense that borrowers right now are uh, not financially prepared to shoulder another bill as they deal with the increased price of food and gas and other necessities. First, do you agree with that sentiment? And second, is it your advice to the President that he extend the payment pause? Uh, so first of all, what did you ask me if I agreed with? I'm sorry. Does the sentiment that uh, borrowers are not now prepared financially to take on another bill, the student loan payment? You know, I think that that's, uh, that's um, a, uh, a very specific question about a very specific group of people. So I've been talking largely today about the impact of a jobs market that's generating historical levels of job gains, 7.9 million jobs since this president got here. And of course, those benefits are uh, uh, occurring to families all across the nation and all across the income scale. For the group that you're talking about, many of them do face uh, real challenges uh, making uh, uh, debt payments. Uh, and uh, I would say that's kind of a different conversation than the one we're having right now. And now, I believe Ron has leaned into that in ways that I'm not remembering right now. But do you have any comments on that? Oh, OK. I, I like that. <laughs> so we're do it together. Um, uh, clearly, a decision will need to be made in advance of the timeline. And obviously, we factor the impacts of uh, you know, economic uh, data on uh, ranges of groups of people, including students. Um, but I don't have anything to announce at this point in terms of any decisions that will be made in, in advance of the timeline. Well said. <clears throat> OK, sorry. Kristen, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, Chair, the President has tapped the Strategic Reserve twice before, mm -hmm. and it still hasn't had the desired impact. Why is this time going to be different? So as I said a, a moment ago, uh, I, I think that uh, 
I, I would definitely challenge the claim that it hasn't had the desired impact. Uh, we saw both in the last release and in this release the price of oil uh, come down quite quickly. Uh, the price of oil, uh, as I checked before I came uh, on here, was down uh, about uh, $7 per barrel. Um, and uh, I, I know that uh, the last time, uh, check it out, because uh, these data are actually quite accessible. Look at what happened to the price, the retail price of gasoline after the last release. Now, there, it's a global market and there's a lot of moving parts, but it is a fact that the price of gasoline fell about 10 cents per gallon shortly after it. Now. If your point is that these uh, releases from the uh, uh, releases from the SPR uh, don't have a uh, you know uh, uh, don't have a structural long-term impact on oil markets, that's why the president used the uh, metaphor of a bridge today. Uh, the idea is to help consumers as they go as, as to help consumers as they deal with uh, uh, elevated uh, inflationary pressures uh, more broadly and specifically with some of the uh, impacts of the Putin price hike on uh, on energy costs uh, and that's what the uh, that's what the release is targeted towards. One more very quickly. Yesterday, uh, Kate was briefing and she said that all options are on the table as it relates to next potential steps that the president may or may not support. Does the president think that a gas tax holiday is a good idea right now? Is that something that he could get behind? Obviously, it's gaining a lot of momentum in the states. Yeah, I'm not going to uh, legislate from here or even get uh, into uh, ongoing policy considerations beyond saying, when we say all options are on the table, we mean it, and that option is... Uh, Do you think it's a good policy? Do I personally think it's a good policy? I think, it's, I think that all options are on the table, and all options, including that one, should be on the table. Okay, Jack, you got to be the last one. Thank you. Um, Jared, yesterday, uh, you know, Brian talked about uh, the Strategic Petroleum Reserve and buying back oil when prices are cheaper in the future. But, you know, long term, as you just mentioned, the release does not solve the problem of the structural deficit in the market. It, and, you know, this administration talks about how you're pushing for domestic producers to ramp up production, but how is that going to happen? Like, the, the fees yesterday that were announced were, are sort of a push to get them to use these, you know, leases, not all of which may produce any energy. But beyond that, the answer I got yesterday was long term, our focus is on, you know, clean energy, and that's why the president invoked the DPA to try to get, you know, battery parts for electric vehicles. That was not, you know, the answer that the oil industry was looking for. The, that answer for, you know, what the long-term plan is shifted away from fossil fuels. So how are they going to um, ramp up production, and why can you say that prices are going to be cheaper in the future where it doesn't seem like there are any friendlier energy policies. Well, first of all, let me just be very clear and specific. When I, my, my comment on retail, the retail cost of gas at the pump relating to the uh, SPR release is very much an empirical pattern that we've seen time and again where an SPR release occurs, the price of oil comes down, we see that at the pump. Uh, and, and as and as I suggested, that's a that's a time limited function. The president president called it a bridge. You're sort of saying a bridge to what? Right. Yeah, and, and I understand that. Well, look, if you believe as I do that this is still a uh, an, uh, a global uh, market, that energy is still a global market and still a competitive market, what you expect to see is at a particular price point where oil is actually probably above uh, oil is probably above that. Uh, price point and certainly has been uh, uh, even higher in recent weeks. Um, uh, historically, that has led to greater energy production. And one of the things you hear the president saying in so many words is that we'd like to see uh, that kind of production, that kind of response uh, from uh, 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 the impact of market forces on, on these uh, decisions of these energy companies. Now, if you don't see that uh, uh, market response, I think you have to ask yourself why, and that involves the kinds of commentary you've heard the president make about industry concentration, about the need for competitiveness, the importance of having an adequate level of competition within uh, our key industries, whether it's energy or meatpacking, uh, because absent, uh, in the presence of excessive concentration and absent adequate competition, price levels can be higher than they otherwise would. So I very much uh, support the president's uh, rhetoric and uh, uh, the, uh, the way he, in which he's leaned into that problem. Uh, but uh, historic, historically, we expect price signals in the energy uh, market to have uh, the effect that they, they've had, and, and we will continue to nudge the companies to move in that direction. But when lenders 
here, you know, what's your long-term solution? When and lenders, the, the, you said? Lenders. Uh -huh. when, when the, we're talking about a long-term solution and then, you know, the administration is talking about clean energy. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's not sending the signal to lenders that this is a, a safe place for investment, that, you know, there's a, this administration is saying plainly we want to increase domestic yeah. production. That's the sort of language they're looking for. So, so I don't, I don't really agree with that framing in the following sense. I think by lenders, I think like I'm thinking of investors, um, uh, and uh, and you know, investors in the energy sector. If you look at the profitability, <clears throat> uh, if you even look at some of the the buybacks and the share prices, investors in that sector have been doing quite well, uh, and that tells you right there that there is a price point wherein it is very possible for a, an energy producer uh, to be highly successful and to make a lot of money in today's economy. And in fact, what we'd like to, with a, I think one of the messages the president has, has been trying to convey to them, that is that on behalf of the American consumers, we're asking you to respond to those price signals so that people can uh, 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 have, a, have an easier time of getting through this tough period. Now, at the same time, we have a medium and a long-term agenda that is absolutely ex existentially important to us to move towards a sustainable economy. And we do that in a way that creates great opportunities for both firms, employers, and for workers. So again, this is not an either or, it is a both and. And I see, a very, uh, I see very much an economic structure in energy markets where uh, they, they can both uh, engage in robust production today and plan for a much cleaner uh, energy future. Thank you, Jared, for joining you. us. You're always welcome. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, okay, um, we will keep you honest and uh, as, lo as long as you can stay uh, before you need to gather and we'll keep you updated. They're going to track it closely from here. I just, I just have a couple of quick updates for you from the top. Um, one is in the State of the Union, the President called on the, uh, out the ocean shipping carriers who raised their prices by as much as 1,000 percent during the pandemic. These costs pass through to American businesses and families and contribute to inflation. And just a month after the President spoke about this at the State of the Union, this pre the Senate yesterday passed overwhelmingly bipartisan legislation to reform the o ocean shipping industry and lower costs for American farmers businesses and consumers. And additionally this week, the Department of Justice announced that it successfully stopped a merger between two companies that make the cranes that move shipping containers on and off of ships at our nation's port, uh, ports. The merger would have harmed American consumers by reducing competition in the supply chain and would have put our global supply chain at risk. And so these steps obviously are positive step forward, steps forward. I also wanted to note that today the Department of Homeland Health and Human Services and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services made important announcements in response to the Vice President's call to action to improve health, health outcomes. Beginning today, as many as 720,000 pregnant and postpartum people across the United States could be guaranteed Medicaid and children's health insurance program coverage for, up, for a full 12 months after pregnancy, thanks to the American Rescue Plan. Finally, um, <clears throat> for the week ahead to next week, or sorry, I had one more thing after this. Um, on Monday, the President will deliver remarks on progress made on his administration's trucking action plan to strengthen our nation's supply chains. On Tuesday, he will deliver remarks celebrating the success of the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid and extending affordable health insurance to millions of Americans. And on Wednesday, the President will address thousands of national, state, and local building trades lend lend leaders from across the country at the North America's Building Trade Union's Legislative Conference. Finally, uh, as you know, uh, the United States is delivering a significant amount of security assistance to Ukraine every day. Over the past few weeks, we have delivered more than $350 million of security assistance to Ukraine, which the Pre Pentagon has described as an unprecedented pace. And we welcome the UK's uh, donor conference yesterday and its announcement that allies and partners will provide coastal defense systems, which is something that President Zelensky has asked for and is something that President Biden discussed extensively with allies at NATO last week. More than 30 nations have now sent security assistance to Ukraine, thanks in part to the leadership of the President and our diplomacy. So why don't I, we're going to get to as many people as possible. Darlene, why don't you kick us off? Thanks, Jen. Welcome back. Thank you. Uh, one question on Russia and two quickly on two other subjects. Russia says that an apparent attack by Ukraine on one of its fuel depots 
is um, making it harder for Russia to stay engaged in the talks to end the war. And I was wondering what the White House thinks of this suggestion from Russia that Ukraine's actions are the ones that are potentially standing in the way of peace over there. Well, I've, we have seen uh, those reports. We're not in a position to comment on the Kremlin statements. I would note Ukraine has not made any statements or confirmation of these reports. I would also note that this is a war that President uh, Putin started, uh, a brutal war with Russia's forces continuing to bombard cities across Ukraine and commit terrible acts of violence. We've seen the people of Ukraine fight violently in the face of unprovoked Russian brutality, but there is one aggressor here, and that is President Putin and the Russian military at his direction. Second, on Title 42, the announcement that it's going to be lifted on May 23rd, can you talk a little bit about why the um, restrictions aren't lifted sooner than May 23rd, perhaps even immediately? Um, people who want to come to the country to seek asylum will not have to wait seven weeks to do so when the CDC says that restriction is no longer necessary. Absolutely. Well, it has always been the case and continues to be the case that this is a health directive determined by the CDC. So let me start there. But I would also say that implementation of their decision uh, requires an interagency process, specifically leadership of the Department of Homeland Security. I would note the statement that was put out by Secretary uh, Mayorkas. And it, it requires uh, the implementation of appropriate COVID-19 mitigation pro protocols, also scaling up capacity and scaling up uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, resources um, needed. Uh, and so it was always going to be important to have an implementation period, and the timeline reflects that. And the last question is, is there any comment on the, um, the vote in Staten Island by Amazon workers to unionize? Sure. <clears throat> Becoming the first in Amazon to, to do that. Well, the President was glad to see workers ensure their voices are heard uh, with respect to important workplace decisions. He believes firmly that every worker in every state must have a free and fair choice to join a union and the right to bargain collectively with their employer. Uh, the Amazon workers in Staten Island made their choice to organize a grassroots union and bargain for better jobs and a better life. Go ahead, Amine. Just in light of the uh, fuel depot fire in Russia, um, what is the U.S.'s general position on potential future attacks by Ukraine on Russian soil? Does the U.S. believe that it is up to the Ukrainians to decide whether such potential attacks are justified, or does it generally believe um, that those kinds of attacks should be discouraged because they would be seen as being escalatory? Sure. Um, well, given we have not uh, confirmed or commented specifically on the reports from here, and neither has Ukraine, I'm not going to get into a future hypothetical. What I would just reiterate again is that this is a, uh, a war of aggression by the Russian leadership, by President Putin, uh, that has left uh, millions of people displaced, homeless, has targeted civilians, hospitals, uh, and other innocent people across Ukraine. Uh, we know who the aggressor is. That is President Putin and Russia. And beyond that, I don't have any comment on military tactics. Uh, the president said yesterday that Vladimir Putin appears to be self-isolating, that he appears to have maybe fired or put under mm -hmm. house arrest certain advisors. Uh, does the U.S. have a clear sense of which advisors are currently advising Putin and who has his ear? Well, the president was speaking uh, yesterday to public reporting, uh, so we don't have more details to speak to uh, at this point, point uh, in time. Uh, but I would say, uh, to go back to a couple of days ago and the information that was put out uh, by the administration uh, that was reflected, that came through our intelligence agencies, what we do know is that uh, this war is not going how President Putin had planned, uh, that uh, his intention of uh, winning a quick war, defeating Ukraine, the Ukrainians quickly, is not how it has played out. Uh, we have seen troops be demoralized. We have seen uh, troops run out of uh, equipment that they need on the Russian side, uh, and that is clearly not what he had planned. In terms of who is advising him, I don't have more specifics on that front from here. And, and just one more on a separate topic. Uh, you're obviously not the only person in the administration recently to test positive for COVID. Can you give us a sense of whether there have been uh, discussions lately at the White House about what would happen if President Biden were to test positive for COVID? Um, help us understand what working from home, quarantining, running the country would look like if the president were to get COVID. 
Um, well, I would first say that uh, this wasn't exactly your question, but let me reiterate this point, is that uh, we take steps over and beyond uh, CDC recommendations and guidelines here. Uh, I would note that um, while I tested positive about 12 days ago, if my math is correct, um, I waited to return to the office until I had a negative test. Uh, and that is uh, our protocol uh, here, or the protocol I uh, was held to. Uh, also, uh, we take steps uh, in, in advance of meeting the president. Uh, anyone who's meeting the president is going to have a test uh, that day. Um, and we also take social distancing steps in meetings when warranted. Uh, in terms of, look, uh, we, we recognize that COVID-19 remains a transmissible disease, especially recent variants. Um, and while I'm not going to get into a future hypothetical of any of our additional principles uh, since, since the, the second gentleman had tested positive, testing positive, I would note that the President of the United States can work from anywhere, um, can run the country from anywhere, um, and uh, we have the capacity uh, to not only uh, prepare for that, but to support anything that is needed. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Jen. Just a quick follow-up on the Staten Island Bell. Sure. Um, it's obviously a big moment for the labor movement in this country, uh, the first union at Amazon. Um, has the president had a chance to speak to labor leaders, or is he planning to issue a statement? Uh, is he planning to talk about it at all? Uh, I, I don't have anything uh, planned to preview for you in terms of uh, an official statement. I'm speaking, of course, on his behalf. Uh, obviously, as you know, the president has been a longtime supporter of um, the right to organize, uh, the right to, for workers to, uh, to organize and plan for better jobs and a better life. Um, and certainly, my comments reflect that. Go ahead. Jen, just uh, oh, sorry. Uh, have a quick uh, follow-up. Uh, just comments from a senior Treasury official mm -hmm. uh, this morning that said uh, sort of the uh, the, uh, the sanctions that have been imposed by the U.S. and its allies on Russia is sort of pushing Russia to become a closed economy. Uh, that is obviously presuming that you know China and others are not sort of making some of the materials that they get from the West available to them. Has has the administration noted any sort of change in stance when it comes to China? Uh, you know, and Russia, or, or is it, you know, is there any evidence that they're providing perhaps military economic support? Um, our assessment has not changed since our national security advisor spoke to this. What I would point out for you, too, as well, is the strong statements that came from European leaders um, given their uh, meeting on exactly this topic uh, today, which certainly we uh, share the sentiment. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> lots of urgent issues discussed here, uh, but with the helicopter approaching, one little bit of housekeeping. <laughs> is it true that you are leaving the White House to work for MSNBC? Uh, well, you can't get rid of me yet, Ed. Um, I have nothing to confirm uh, about my length of public service or planned service uh, or anything about consideration about next plans. I'm very happy to be standing with all of you here today after it felt like a never-ending, endless time in my basement, quarantining away from my family. Uh, and believe it or not, I missed you all a lot. Um, and my focus um, every day continues to be speaking on behalf of the President, answering your questions, as tough as they may be at many times, as difficult as they may be to answer at many times. And uh, I hope that I meet my own bar of treating everybody with fairness and being equitable. And, and just because this has been raised by our colleagues, by people who are observing this process, is it ethical for you to continue conducting this job while negotiating uh, with the media? Well, um, I have always gone over and above the stringent ethical and legal requirements of the Biden administration. And I take that very seriously. And uh, as a standard for every employee of the White House, I have received rigorous ethics counseling, including uh, as it relates to any future uh, employment. Uh, I've complied with all ethics requirements and gone beyond and taken steps to recuse myself from uh, decisions as appropriate. Um, and so uh, I hope uh, that all of you, I've been working with all of you some time, would judge me for my record and how I treat all of you, uh, both in the briefing room and otherwise. And I try to answer questions from everybody um, across the board. I know everybody in the back of the room may not always be pleased with me, but I try my best. Uh, and I will I will certainly continue to do that. Jen, given the reports, which have now been confirmed by multiple media outlets, how can you continue to be an effective briefer if you do, in fact, have plans to join a media outlet? 
Well, I have nothing, again, to announce about any conversations or any future plans. Um, and at whatever time I leave the White House, I can promise you the first thing I'm going to do is sleep and spend time with my three and six-year-olds, who are my most important audiences uh, of, of all. Um, but I would say, Kristen, that uh, again, I uh, have done, uh, have taken the ethics, legal requirements uh, uh, to the highest uh, very seriously uh, in any discussions and any considerations about any future employment, just as any White House official would. And I've taken steps beyond that to ensure there's no conflicts. And I understand what you're saying, but I guess the question is, how is it ethical to have these conversations with media outlets while you continue to have a job standing behind that podium? Well, there are uh, a range of stringent ethical and legal requirements that are imposed on everybody in this administration and many administrations past about any conversations you're having with future employers. Um, that is true of any industry you're working in. Uh, and I have abided by those and tried to take steps to go beyond that as well. And broadly speaking, is it the policy of this White House to allow staffers to have discussions, even if indirectly, with institutions uh, that impact and affect their jobs and your job here? Well, the, it is the policy of this White House to ensure that anyone who is having conversations about future employment uh, does so through consultation with the White House Counsel's Office and, by, and ensuring they abide by any ethics and re legal requirements. And uh, those are conversations that I have uh, taken very seriously and, and abided by every component of. Back of the oh, room. okay. So let me go, Serena. We can go, and then we can wrap. Thank you, Jen. Can you, you said you missed us. That the U.S. <laughs> I, I do. Okay. I know it, it may be that people who may have to see the president depart, and I don't want to hold anyone back. But I also am happy to answer your question and a couple of others if people want to stay. But if people need to, are they gathering right now? Sorry to interrupt your train of thought here. Okay. Go ahead. Can you confirm reports that the U.S. has been providing Ukraine with protective equipment such as gas masks, hazmat suits, and other materials against a possible chemical weapons attack from Russia? Uh, so the United States and members of the international community have, of course, repeatedly warned about the potential for Russia to use chemical or biological weapons in Ukraine and that Moscow is possibly planning a false flag operation. In an effort to assist our Ukrainian partners, the U.S. government is providing the government of Ukraine with life-saving equipment and supplies that could be deployed in the event of Russia. Russian use of a chemical and biological weapon against Ukraine. It does not uh, compromise our domestic preparedness in any way, shape, or form, just for everybody's awareness. But we are providing it as we are providing a range of materials and equipment. And there's one quick question on another subject. The House passed a bill today that would remove marijuana from the federal schedule of controlled substances. Every Democrat, save for two, voted in favor of this bill. Does the President support the legislation? Um, <clears throat> well, first let me say that, um, as the President said during the campaign, our current marijuana laws are not working. Uh, he agrees that we need to rethink our approach, including to address the racial disparities and systemic in oh, okay. inequities uh, in our criminal justice system, broaden research on the effects of marijuana, and support the safe use of marijuana for medical purposes. Uh, we look forward to working with Congress to achieve our shared goals, and we'll continue having discussions with them about this objective. Jackie, go ahead. Thank you, Jackie. Oh, okay, I'm going to wrap up in a second here, and then I'll go to Karen. <laughs> Okay, so there, you guys just got to wrap. Um, yeah. uh, I'm sure we will get you a, let me, let us get you a thorough comment on that. I will say, as the President conveyed in his announcement yesterday, um, certainly working with the global community to ensure we are meeting the supply shortages in the global community at this time is part of our effort to reduce gas prices for Americans, given it's a global oil market. Uh, so it's part of that, and we will get you a more comprehensive. I am here and in my office yeah, if you guys I, have a quick question. question on inflation. Sure. Real quick. Uh, today the President blamed Putin's invasion of Ukraine for not just higher gas prices but also higher food prices. Uh, inflation was at 7.4 percent in January before the invasion. Uh, in February, it went up to 7.9 percent. Putin didn't invade until the 24th. So March is really going to show the impact of uh, the invasion. And that report doesn't even come out until April 12th. So how are people supposed to believe the Putin price hike is to blame for food prices going up when the timeline doesn't add up? Well, here's what the president is reflecting on. One, 
the, the price of gas has gone up by approximately a dollar or more uh, since uh, Putin started lining up troops at the border. This is something that outside economists have spoken to as well, not just the administration. And those are just factual details about how much the price of gas has gone up. We know that's a huge impact. Uh, and when you say inflation, people think the cost on their pocketbook and the impact on their budgets. Uh, the second piece on the availability of food, we know that different markets around the world are impacted uh, by, uh, by the uh, lack of production in Ukraine and other because of the war, and we know that that could impact global food prices. Yet. This is the first time we've heard the president blame Putin for higher food prices. I think what the president's looking at is what the impact has been in a lot of areas that are leading to uh, price increases on people's pocketbooks and where we could see it increasing over the course of time. Yes, I'm here in my office. Well, I see you all. Who will replace you?